these glorious waters off the South African coast are home to a fearsome predator that's right at the top of the food chain. We're here because they've recently caught in their beach protection nets the biggest great white shark they've seen since 2002. And by carefully dissecting the body, we're going to reveal the deadly nature of its infamous jaws and how it can smell and detect just a few drops of blood from miles away and how sharks became the biggest of all fish in the seas. Join us as we go deep inside the Great White Shark. Great white sharks are regular visitors to the rugged coastline of Mossel Bay. But the huge great white caught up the coast presents a unique opportunity for experts to learn about the shark's anatomy. An international team quickly assembles. Wow, that's some collection, isn't it? From South Africa, leading shark attack expert Jeremy Cliff. His jaw collection is the stuff of nightmares. Unfortunately, we've still got this paranoia that the general public have with sharks. The old adage, the only good shark is a dead shark. From Italy, shark researcher Enrico Gennari. Yeah, 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 he likes it. He risks life and limb for his passion. We know some sharks for years. You know, when you go out with your buddies to have a beer, you know them by name. And from New York, comparative anatomist Joy Reidenberg, whose scalpel's always ready for a new species. Just remember to close the top. I don't want to be sitting in a bait box. It's huge. It's much bigger than I thought it yeah, would be. Yeah, I didn't think it would be this big. Wow. It's really a big animal. And looks like it's a female. So it's a female. Do we know what weight it is? How old do you think it might be? 900 kilos. Probably in the region of about 12 years old. That's a big fish. As scientists, we want to look under its skin to reveal the great white's deepest secrets why it will die if it ever stops swimming. How it's evolved to become such a formidable athlete. And how its internal organs cope with the wildest feeding frenzies. But the more immediate mystery with this shark is what's in its mouth. It looks like its last meal, but it's not. It is the stomach, and there are two possible hypotheses why the stomach is out. Sharks are able to revert the stomach to get rid of their stomach contents in case uh, you know, they have something that they can't really digest. So kind of like a form of vomiting then, Basically, yes. That's so and weird. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> like... That really is weird. And then I know that the possibility is that in terms of stress, they also can get stress and re release the stomach out uh, to, but, you know. It seems that this shark vomited out its own stomach in the panic of being trapped in the net. First job is obviously going to be to get it onto the dissection table um, yeah. so that we can get it down and then orientate it to, to start the dissection. Yeah. 
Philip Zungu, the Natal Shark Board's top dissector, makes the first cut. Joy's raring to join in. She's dissected many whales before, but this is her first great white. How, how does this compare to cutting whales? It's actually harder to cut because the skin is so rough, it dulls the knife. It's like cutting through sandpaper. Whereas when you're cutting a whale, even though they have blubber and they have a much thicker skin, it's more like cutting jello. So you can actually slice through it fairly easily and really can feel it like sandpaper. Exactly. Getting, it, getting it, caught on it, it like sandpaper. It was used, actually, shark skin really? and sandpaper and still in some place around Australia. It's still used. Amazing. In fact, closer examination of the shark's rough skin provides clues to its evolution, as Richard Dawkins explains. If you should happen to be in a position to stroke a shark, you can do it one way like that, but if you do it the other way, it's rough. And the reason is that the whole skin is covered with little tiny teeth. If you look at an ordinary fish, like a trout, it's covered with scales and there are various fossil groups of fish which are covered with bony armor plating. But sharks have this immensely tough chain mail and it's made of little miniature teeth. They're just the same as the big teeth which sharks use to eat with. It looks as though probably what happened in evolution is that the micro teeth of the skin became the teeth that they use to eat. That's extraordinary, isn't it? It's just uh, amazing how those uh, animals are, uh, adapt. From the evolution point of view, these teeth come from the shark skin. Yes, but it seems pretty loose when you touch them. Come in here, this they, is, they are, this is, they're really loose. This oh, is, they really are the loose. Amount of movement in that. I really thought these were going to be fixed into the jaws. The last thing you'd expect in a shark is wobbly teeth, yet somehow they've turned an apparent weakness into a deadly advantage. We have a look at the jaw of a great white. You'll see the teeth are, are V-shaped and serrated, but what's really amazing is that there's so many teeth produced. If you look there, you can see the teeth in rows behind the functional row that are just waiting to replace the outer row. So you've got one row of teeth that's actually functional, but you've got all these other teeth as kind of spares in the wings behind. Yes, they're essentially just waiting to replace the outer teeth. The teeth are not embedded in sockets like we have with mammals, but they're connected to a layer of tissue very similar to our fingernails. And that tissue is growing from the inside of the jaw out. It's a continuous process, very slow. And as that tissue grows, so the, the teeth right at the front of the mouth eventually will fall off. That's a phenomenal adaptation, isn't it, for a predator? Because if you've got a big pred you know, land mammal predator like a lion, once it's broken its adult teeth, it's, it's done for, it's doomed. Complete. Whereas for the shark, it just waits and another new on. set come along. But it's extraordinary when you think <laughs> how, <laughs> how easily fully, I could be eaten fully, by this. Fully jacked open. If you were a you know, Cape fur seal, oh, yeah. I'd be dead. Chopped in half I'd and a good beheaded. chunk of food. <laughs> wow, that's, that's amazing. Enrico's keen for us to meet his razor-sharp friends. We're going to find out how hard they really bite and track their movements across the bay. This is charm, and these usually attract uh, white shark. It's like making homemade pasta. It gives you also some kind of uh, pride. <laughs> they feel the, so the passion in it. Oh, yeah. It's made with my heart. Oh. And, and your feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, low tech but effective. Is that the chemicals that they're after? Is it like hemoglobin? Biologist Simon Watts curious to see whether Enrico's oily footwork will tempt in the sharks. Sharks don't swim like in the movie Jaws uh, with the dorsal fin out all the time with the music on the background. It's not there. <laughs> after hours of waiting, I hear that music. Wait, here comes something. There's something in your blood. It's a shark. 
Be like shark, water. shark. There it is. It's, there by, we the, go. it's by the bait. Okay. Here we go, everybody. A bigger one. Woo! It's oh, man, look under. at that. How exciting is that? They are so close. That's the front one. Whoa! 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 It's huge. Oh my god, that's huge. That's the biggest the one we looked at. Hey, good boy. You didn't I promise you a big one? Oh okay. yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's big enough? It's scary. Okay. <laughs> Mossel Bay, where we're dissecting our shark, is a popular resort. Its waves attract surfers, and its fur seals draw in great whites. An uneasy harmony exists between the two. While the team crack on with the dissection around the head, which is pretty delicate, it's worth just taking a look at the whole animal and reflecting on what probably most of the people here watching think about great white sharks. Because since the film Jaws, most people see these animals as some kind of mindless assassins of the sea, hell-bent on eating anything that comes in their way, and that includes us. Great whites rarely attack humans. When they do, the surprising fact is that most people survive the ordeal. To find out why, we're going to investigate the anatomy of the shark bite. We could see the upper jaw over here, and we're trying to dissect away into this big muscle. And we're talking about the, the jaw closers are all this bit here. So yes. that, we're just seeing a part of it here, but it's, it's literally exactly. this, this whole thing on the It looks like this whole pocket of stuff is just muscle. These muscles remind me of the ones that we saw on the crocodile that were used in closing the jaw. In fact, they're very whitish in color. So I'm presuming that they're also very fast twitch muscles that have to act suddenly. I was curious to compare a great white spite with the crocodile bite we'd measured before. Okay, everybody set? Everybody set? Here we go. Everybody ready? Oh, wow. Great bite. Dang. Oh, that was good. Let's have it. a look. So that's 1,413 pounds. That's about 600 and something kilograms. That's what? 20 times stronger than my bite. To tempt a great white to bite in his meter, Enrico surrounds it with rotting fish. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Come on. A little bite. It's juicy. Come on, turn. Yes. Uh, uh, higher. A bit higher. Uh. What he did here was touching. It was just. Well, how, how much is the reading? 29. 29 pounds. Nothing. My bite is much stronger than that one. This weak, exploratory bite is the reason most shark attack victims escape with their lives. Once they realize we're not tasty seal blubber, they usually don't come in for the second killer bite. But now, he should come back. Because he knows there's something tasty inside. And now, let's hope to have a stronger bite. Give it back! Give it back! It's mine! Let it go! Ah! Oh no, the... Ah. Not the bit! It's mine, not you! Here you go! Go away! Go away! Go away! Go away. Go away. <laughs> Look at that. What was the reading? Uh, it was about 90 pounds. 90 pounds? 90 pounds is about 40 kilos. It's about my bites. 
It's also, you can see, didn't go really for the bite meter, most for the bull. But that's quite a weak bite. Even when they do come in for the kill, their bite is no match for the crocodiles. I suppose you're saying different techniques, basically. So the, the crocodile and the alligators are wanting to hold on to their prey and they use the water to drown it, whereas this is one to take a big chunk out of it, isn't it? Exactly. The crocodile can have something like 3,000 maximum pound uh, of bite strength. Here, the white shark, the maximum that we have uh, um, uh, seen for um, a three and a half, four meter shark is about 500, 600 pounds. It's much lower than a crocodile. It's hard to believe such huge jaw muscles deliver such an unimpressive bite. But it's easy to see why, after dissecting the jaw. And here's the edge of the jaw itself, okay. because it's not physically attached to the cranium. It's a separate piece. You can get your fingers behind there and feel it's all separate. Oh, that's this incredible. wiggles yeah, separately. That. The skull is, is pretty firmly attached in here, I know. This is being held up by a hook mechanism right here. So this is pretty stable. But I can wiggle this back and forth. But this is kind of wiggly. At first glance, this weak jaw arrangement with the upper jaw floating free from the skull seems to offer few benefits, whereas the crox jaw, which is moulded into the skull, results in a much more powerful bite. But hanging free has its advantages too. When a shark opens its mouth, the jaws can be thrust forward, enlarging the size of its bite. The prehistoric looking goblin shark has taken this ability to the extreme. And that is one of the adaptations to be able to take a large chunk out of a big prey item like a whale, where the shark will open its jaw and then will lift its snout. And in, in, in the action of lifting its snout, it's actually almost dislocating that upper jaw forwards to be able to give it a really good, uh, good bite. There's one final puzzle to solve in the anatomy of the bite. How did this bizarre jaw evolve? To answer this question, we need to continue our dissection by examining the shark's breathing apparatus, its gills. OK, I think we should now expose the gills and look at them from the inside, Yeah. see how they're arranged. Yeah, I need the big one. Thank you. How cool would it be if we could just dive in there and, and still extract oxygen out of water? Yeah, but then, then we, you come out of the water, you come breathing there. <laughs> you gotta pick one or the other. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta have everything. If we cut back along the gills, we see these wonderful feathery structures. Very pretty, actually. And each one of these is like leaves of a book. So you can take each page of gills and flap them back and forth here. So this is where all the respiration is occurring. So water's coming this way and the blood is running across the gills back and forth this way. So as these two run against each other in two different currents, that's where the oxygen exchange is occurring. A great white must keep swimming to ensure a continuous flow of oxygen-rich water across its gills. If it stops, it suffocates. Each one of these gills is supported by a cartilage bar. Here's one of those bars right here. Its whole purpose is, is just to suspend these gills. Amazingly, it's these gill bars that you can see inside a shark's throat that hold the key to the jaw's evolution. If we go back to the shark's ancient ancestors before they had jaws, their gills were probably held open by simple cartilage bars. Initially, it's thought that tiny hairs helped draw water through their gills. In later generations, the gill bars became hinged, so they could work like a pair of bellows, pumping water in and out. The hinged bars at the front were now perfectly positioned for a new role. 
to trap food. And so the jaw was born. So in fact, you have these two bars, the upper and lower jaw, and then you have behind here, you can feel right here is another big cartilage support. This is actually another arch of the gills. It's taken the breathing apparatus and made a weapon out of it. That's amazing. The front part. It's made a jaw with these wonderful, dangerous teeth. Okay, one, two. Enrico offers Joy and Simon the chance to go eye to eye with a great white in a shark cage. <laughs> <laughs> they love doing all this though, you know, actually getting in the water with the sharks is, I think, really important to these guys. That's addictive. It's, it's addictive. Okay, I'm ready. I'm psyched. Simon's never dived before, and he's seen the YouTube clips of what can go wrong. But he has a more pressing anxiety. His sea legs are failing him. All right, buddy, you okay? Usually feel better after that. Okay, here's something for your mouth. No. <laughs> Jeez. Happens to everybody, you know. It's gonna happen again. <laughs> well, you'll feel better when you're in the water, actually. Won't be rocking as much. Yep, just you see that one that swam by? I'm a little scared, actually. <laughs> so beautiful to watch and they look so peaceful and they don't look very aggressive how could this be a harmful animal it's so gorgeous oh wow look at it wow side by side like a dance one two three four five sharks it's amazing that's a party this big flat black eye it stares right at you and all of a sudden you get this feeling that is it really thinking about me the shark is making circles around the boat closer and closer like a spiral so that the more at ease they are the closer they get Oh my god. You right? I think I was so excited I bit my lip. <laughs> I'm bleeding. <laughs> wow. I was so excited watching them down there. And it, especially when it came really, really close and you could see that dark eye. Some people think that sharks, the white shark eyes, dead, dead basically, it's dark and without any emotion. But when, when you interact daily with them, you actually you see that, they, as you said, they're checking you out. They, maybe it's not because they're interested in you as a bait, a prey, but they're interested in you it's because curious, they're just right? interested in you, full stop. The eye of the great white is mesmerizing. It never blinks because it has no eyelid. Some say they never sleep, but no one knows for sure. These eyes are unusual. They're very, very big compared to other sharks, aren't they? They are, and it suggests that for white sharks, vision is probably quite important. So they never close their eyes, other than the moment of striking their prey, where they'll actually just move the eye back. 
see how the eye just rolls back in its yeah. socket. So it just rolls it completely back out of the way to protect it. Look at the eye roll back after this attack. The eyes also have another layer of defense. We've taken the eye out from the socket. We're going to just place it on the back of the shark here and try to cut through it. Otherwise, just cut with a scalpel. Hang on. It's really hard. It just shows you how effective this could be against the seal claw. I was going to suggest just if you cut a ring it around with a scalpel like that. Very yeah, solid. And just take the well, that helps answer the question, doesn't it? It's a very, very thick walled eye. Let's eyeball. try cutting this That's way. It. That's it. Okay, so let's just very carefully just try and separate that off there. Okay. Oh, look, Mark. So that's his That's lens. the lens. So here. So if we, we pop that out, it'll be very round. Got it. You got it? I've got it. So there it is. It's, it's, like really a mar it's like a marble. Really round. Yeah, that is absolutely stunning. The shark's excellent vision is a vital asset, but it has a battery of other senses to help track down its prey. One of the senses that we often hear about with sharks is their ability to detect blood in the water. So to smell their prey is pretty incredible. They have a nose, like we do. Unlike us, in a shark, each nostril has an inlet to let the water in, and also an outlet to let the water out. And the nose is particularly adapted for picking up small particles, such as blood. So they compare one nostril to the other to detect which direction the scent is coming from and home in on it, kind of like a bloodhound. I mean, we've got no ears on this. Well, actually, there is an ear inside, but there's a, only a tiny remnant to the outside. So their sense of hearing might not be very directional, but they have this to make up for it. It has a special sensory system called the lateral line, which is really tuned in to vibrations. And it actually can be seen all along this part of the body here. There's little dimples all along the skin. And if we look very close here where we've cut into the skin, you can actually see the lateral line system cut in cross section, bringing input back to the brain to let the shark know that it sends some vibration in the water. As it hones in on its prey and it rolls its eyes back in its socket to protect the eyes, it's now blind. So it has to use another sense to detect where its prey is, and that's this electromagnetic sense. So all of these little pores on the front of the snout, which are called the ampullae of Lorenzini, which have this jelly in them, are able to detect an electromagnetic field, which is what is emitted from every living creature. And that is picked up by the brain as another sense, a unique sense that these animals have. This part of the shark is very sensitive. And with a white shark, if you put the, push the nose back, actually it's like overloading their sense and they get in a kind of a, almost sleeping mode for a few seconds. So if you punch a shark in the nose, you can basically hypnotize it. <laughs> you, you, you could, you could, I don't know, I wouldn't Stop try it, with this it. one, but I, uh, <laughs> No, I'm not planning on sticking my head into the shark's face. <laughs> That's a girl. This is a girl. How do you know? How do we know? Which a girl is in which a... Which is a man? Because if you look at the other end of the shark, it has special fins. And the fins look different in the boys than they do in the girls. Oh, now yeah. I understand. Yeah. This female's special fins are hidden under her massive bulk. On a smaller hammerhead shark, Joy tells the fishy version of the birds and the bees. If you look at this part of the shark, these are the fins near the anus. And if you look right inside the fins, you see these little bumps right here? That's what boy sharks have. Girl sharks don't have that. So that's how you know, without even opening it up, whether it's a boy or a girl. Oh, now I see. These little bumps are called claspers. And they're used like a penis is used. So they insert these into the girl and use this to put the sperm inside. No one has ever seen great whites mate. 
but if they perform like these white tip sharks, they'll need that armoured skin to protect them from the world's most dangerous love bite. Sharks mate more like mammals than most other fish. The females keep their eggs within their bodies and the males fertilise them inside. When angler Sean Gregory started gutting a shark on a beach in North Carolina, his friends were in for a shock. Oh my God! Oh, it's a baby. It's a baby it's shark. It's a baby in there. It's a baby shark. You can save the baby. Where? Where's the baby? Don't hurt it. Don't hurt it. Don't hurt it. Right here. Yeah, in that cell. Yeah. It's a baby. Oh, sure. Got you. Oh my God! Look at that shark. Oh, look, Sean, you're getting right to a shark. It's oh, birth by Sean oh, section. Yeah. So far we've seen how sharks use their senses to hunt prey and how their infamous jaws evolved. Next we want to investigate what keeps these huge animals afloat and how they propel themselves so fast. One, two, three! One, two, three! Yes! Yes! <laughs> well done, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Yes! 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 <laughs> Sharks have one vital organ that holds the key to how they became so big. To reach it, Philip cuts through the white underbelly that gives the great white its name. Joy, have you ever seen such a big liver in your life? No, I've never. <laughs> Not even in the biggest whales have I seen a liver quite like this. It's coming, it's coming. This is just one of the three lobes. This, this is only, only, only one. one. This is one. One liver lobe. One. Whoa. <laughs> this is freaky. <laughs> Careful, guys. It's what going down, it's going down. Okay, one, two. Is that another lobe, too? Yeah. yeah. This is two. Okay. 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 Right, here comes the rest. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Ah. Uh. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you forgot the one piece. <laughs> Try to lie down. Yeah. <laughs> it's about your size. You want to see eh? if it's as big as me? It's about. It's bigger than you. What do you think? <laughs> Two inches longer than you. <laughs> I am totally mind boggled by this. I can't believe how big this liver is. It's it's bigger than I am. In nature, you have to always think why something happened, so why this liver is so big. Uh, if, if you look at the shark, and you can see that inside doesn't have, uh, like other fish have, the swim bladder. The, the swim bladder basically is a gas chamber that expands and decreases volume in order to help the, the, the fish to float. Like a, like a buoyancy compensator that a scuba diver would wear. Where you can change the volume and change the buoyancy that you need to be at. It's exactly to keep them the neutrally thing. buoyant in the water. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. There's something in this that helps it with buoyancy, but what? How? If you think what it does when you put liver in water. Well, put a piece in and we'll, we'll do a mini test. Here we have uh, sheep uh, liver. So this is lamb's liver. Okay. Let's see what it does. So it's on the bottom? Yeah. It's definitely on the bottom. It sinks, which is a good thing. That liver's normal. Okay, let's try it with the shark liver. Okay, let's cut a little a piece of it. That's right. Oh, it's, yeah. Voila. And it floats. So what does it tell you? It's got an inbuilt buoyancy aid. This exactly. is like a big life preserver. Exactly. The liver is full of this oil that is called squalene from the name of squalus, that is a shark, basically. Okay. And it is a very fat liver, very dense in oil. If you put oil in water, what happened to the oil? It floats. It floats. And the first thing that you said about this thing, you said, is huge, and you think yeah. it weights a lot. And actually, it helps the shark not to sink.
Another thing that helps the buoyancy of sharks is that they don't have a single bone in their body. Unlike us and most other vertebrates, where our skeleton is mostly made of hard, solid bone, sharks have cartilage instead of bone. Their skeleton is made of cartilage. We have cartilage. We have cartilage in our ears and in our noses. And in the embryo, all our bones start off as cartilage. But a shark only has cartilage. And this gives them lightness, it gives them a flexibility, and it enables them to become the largest fish in the sea. Today, the very largest is the whale shark, which can weigh up to 20 tons. They're harmless filter feeders that swim around, sucking in plankton. But have there ever been any larger sharks? The problem is that when these animals die, unlike bony fish, their skeletons rarely become fossils. So fossilized shark skeletons are so rare how do we know anything about their evolution? Fortunately, there is one hard structure in a shark's body, and it makes lots of them. Almost everything we know about shark evolution, we've learned from examining their fossilized teeth. From this, we figured out what they ate and how big they could get. And when you find a tooth like this, you realize that they got very, very big indeed. This is Megalodon, weighing in at 100 tons and measuring 20 meters. Megalodon simply means big tooth. Just like the serrated teeth in a great white, these are used for slicing, not chewing. So Megalodon and the great white both had to evolve a digestive system that could cope with huge chunks of food. What strikes me when I look at what's left after the liver's been removed is that there's hardly any guts at all. So this is essentially its intestines, which is a very peculiar shape. It looks very straight. You expect it to be all coiled up like it is in a mammal. In a human, you'd have about eight meters of this going back and forth, twisting around. Completely bizarre. So can we have a look inside and see how that works? Yeah, let's, let's cut it open and see how it's arranged. That has an interesting smell. <laughs> this fish has definitely been eating something. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it kind of looks like the so gills. Look at all these little incredible folds. Incredible, like just leaves. So what's the flow through here then? Because we know but the stomach evolves through the mouth, so that, that bit's right. up there. But once you've gotten into the beginning of the intestinal tract, which is, starts right about here somewhere, but the solids would go all around the periphery here in each one of these grooves. It looks like a big spiral staircase. Here's the beginning of the spiral right here. See how my finger goes underneath like that? So this is one plate right there. Okay, so it's then going in like this. Right, so we'd go into the next plate, which would take it around to the next level. It would come around into here, and there's the entrance to the next one. And it just keeps going around. Wow. I mean, the whole point of any intestines is to get big surface area for absorption of nutrients from the food. Well, I think you're getting it here over a very short length. That is such a neat solution to the problem, isn't it? This unique spiral valve is surely one of the most compact digestive systems to evolve in such a large animal. Although it seems to have one serious flaw, unlike crocodiles, sharks find it hard to digest bone. That's why they need to invert their stomachs when they've bitten off more than they can chew. Is this a really slow process? Because, I mean, being in it's a fish, it's cold-blooded, so on that basis, does it have a very slow metabolism, a very slow digestion? You're talking about fish in general? I'm talking, about, no, I'm talking about this one. I mean, it's cold-blooded, cold so therefore, slow system. I have to give you a bad news, actually. These are not cold-blooded animals. They're, but it's a fish. Yeah. Unlikely, the majority of fish, these are able to maintain higher body temperature than the external water temperature. So they're warm-blooded? Yeah. How does a fish achieve that? In order to show you that, I, we have to cut in section, and it's going to be easier to show you that. We can cut, start cutting from here and going backward. OK, okay yeah. so here's, here's a knife. Enrico wants to expose the tail muscles to see how they increase the great white's body temperature. During a lifetime of constant swimming, 
they can travel 20 times round the Earth, yet they also have enough reserve power for sudden bursts of acceleration. This is the powerhouse of this shark. This is what propels almost a ton of shark through the water and it's always swimming. So this thing is going backwards and forwards the whole time, but also can get this thing right out of the water, which is, which is some feet. In, in very few seconds, yes. So what drives this? Is inside here. Okay. And you cut right through, and this is just jam-packed with muscle. Over 85, 90% of the, this is just muscle. Absolutely extraordinary. Is it all the same kind of muscle? No. The red muscle sustain the majority of the swimming of the shark. The white muscle instead is used for sudden burst. So of like the breaching out of the water, it comes all from the white part. So are these guys generating most of the heat then by that constant, just slow movement, they're constantly generating heat. They're, they're like a furnace. Exactly. It turns out this continual firing of the deep red muscles is what makes these sharks warm blooded. So having higher temperature, the vision, the stomach, the muscle works in a much better way. So I guess sharks don't kill in cold blood anymore, do they? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Not a cold blood killer. Yeah, you're right. Enrico's love affair with the great white began as a boy when he saw a documentary about sharks. Later, he left Italy for Mossel Bay to try to find out more about these elusive giants. Nobody step in front of me from now on, eh? Safe off. He tracks their movements by darting them with radio tags. This is Pasella, guys. Being so long in the same place, we know some sharks for years. Like when you go out with your buddies to have a beer, you know them by name. And the, of course, the one that you remember the most are the, are the biggest and the most charismatic ones. Pasella is not very big, but it's very feisty. Coming. Maybe another shark is better for taking. <laughs> Ready? Perfect. You got it. Perfect. Done! Well done! Mission accomplished. Bye bye. Go and do your sharky business. Why shark is the iconic shark uh, in terms of fear? People hate them. Uh, people uh, want to kill them. And. I mean, uh, when, when I was a kid, I always support for the Indians rather than the cowboys. I always supported the weakest side. And that's why I really want to, with my study, to make a difference. We know what Enrico thinks about sharks, but what goes on in the mind of a great white? Joy has one final cut to make. She's about to lift the lid on its very weird brain. It's been very clear, hasn't it, from this dissection, that this is one very complicated animal. And the bit that Joy's desperate to get to now is the brain, because that's the computer that controls all the body systems that we've seen. But it's a very difficult area to get to. It's not actually in a bony skull, it's in a cartilage cranium. But first of all, you've got to take the head off to lay it flat to be able to get at it, and that's a tough old job. Is it free? Oh, yeah. oh now we're free. Okay, let's turn up Jaws here. Okay. Oh, yes. And how are you going to turn it? Do you want it? <laughs> well, I'm just finished cutting off the last bit of cartilage. And now what we're looking into is the actual cavity where the brain sits. And in the middle here is the brain. So the thinking part of the brain is actually right over here. It's fairly small. Most of the rest of this brain is involved in sensory perception. And it, if you go forward, you see it's actually a Y-shaped brain as it terminates in these two canals 
one for each of the nasal openings. But most of what you're seeing here is all processing sensation, smell, vision, these ampullae of Lorenzini, which are not just under the front of the nose, they're all across the top of the head. So this brain might be small, but it's super specialized. It's really focused on all of these special senses. So this animal is thinking in a very different way than we do. We might sit around and think about stuff using a lot of our gray matter. These animals are working mostly on instinct, but they're processing so much more sensory information. The great white's killer instinct has propelled it to the summit of the ocean's food chain. But we're not part of that food chain. More people are killed by kitchen toasters than by sharks. The truth is, it's the sharks who should fear us. Every year, 70 million are killed for their fins and left to die. Everyone knows that tigers are an endangered species, but it's said that there are fewer great white sharks left in the world than tigers. Sharks have been around as top predators for hundreds of millions of years, but sadly it seems that now they may have met their match. They unfortunately are very misunderstood. The only thing that people see is actually this one, that the, the teeth, the jaws. Oh, I see there's so many special features about this animal that make it such an incredible creature. So it's more than just a mouth with teeth. Yeah, it's not just jaws. <laughs> we really hope our dissections helped convince you that great white sharks are far from mindless murderers. They've developed ingenious ways to find, catch and consume their prey. The remarkable product of 400 million years of evolution. Next week, we're in the Florida Everglades on the trail of giant pythons. We'll reveal how these animals sense, squeeze and swallow huge prey. And we'll investigate how snakes have adapted to conquer almost every corner of the planet. Next tonight on more for albino footballers from Tanzania and how they're challenging prejudice through their football. True stories. Well, next here, with the Big Do kicking off tomorrow night from 9, we thought we'd get you in the mood. So Big Brother's Big Awards show is coming up.